Our first speaker this morning, as I said, is Miguel Lopez. He has learned from many of the best coaches from his native Spain, as well as all over the USA, in his previous role as assistant coach at the University of Florida in the 1990s. Currently running the FINA program for Southeast Asia in Thanyapura, Thailand, Miguel has produced over 150 national record holders for 18 different countries, and eight of his swimmers represented their countries to compete at the 2016 Rio Olympics. Here to present coaching heterogeneous groups, please welcome Miguel Lopez. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I feel very um, fortunate to be in front of some, of co some coaches that have accomplished a lot more than me, um, and certainly a lot of people that um, work with a lot of athletes the way we want to work. And like I said, like, like he said um, in introducing, I think um, the word is I was exposed to a very diverse group of people. So first I trained with the head national coach in Spain and I was very fortunate because he was a very wise, older person that gave a sense of peace. And then I worked, um, I trained at Mission Bay where we learned the importance, not of a coach, but of a support group. So we had Mark Schubert, which was a great distance coach, but he based himself in a biomechanic, which was Walt Schluter, in a um, physiotherapist, in a psychologist. Um, we did lactate um, testing with uh, Michael Loberg and Urgent Madsen. And so we had a lot of different experts providing di that diversity. And then we changed to Steve Baldman, who's now the coach at Texas A&M. And that was another blessing because he was extremely technical and brought a totally different approach to coaching. And then at the University of Florida, I worked with Randy Reeves, who was very much into power at the time. And then we um, brought in Steve, um, um, sorry, Mitch Ivey and um, Skip Foster. And they were absolutely different in the approaches they had. So that diversity um, is something that all coaches need to keep in mind we are going to evolve through our career and being exposed to different ideas helps a lot. Um, as well, when I started coaching, I was exposed to a big management area where we started in a very small club that I created myself and then I gathered a group of parents to build a fantastic 50 meter indoor pool. And we did that, we started with zero budget and creating that um, gave me a lot of um, administrative skills and then I worked at the Naval Academy. I was a teacher at the Spanish Naval Academy for five years which gave me a different discipline background and then finally I was the manager at Playitas Resort which is the biggest sports resort in Europe and that um, gave me something that I think is very important and it is the mentality that you want to make your client come back. That service mentality that sometimes as a coach, I didn't have because as a young coach, I just wanted to um, plan the workout and make them do it. As a manager in a hotel that had temporary clients, I wanted to make those clients want to come back. And having that service mentality has helped me very much throughout the rest of my career. And another thing that I think is important in diversity, and that reflects in that some of my assistant coaches have later become successful in their fields. Um, one of them became the Peruvian national uh, coach. Another one went on to uh, be the assistant coach at the uh, National Performance Center in, in Blume in Madrid, and another one who wasn't even from the swimming background became the head coach of a big academy in Bangkok. And, and I feel this is because as coaches, 
if we consider that one coach doesn't train a team, but a support group does, you empower that support group with different tasks, and then you make it more meaningful. So whether my assistant coaches were specialized into running the dryland better or being in charge of the psychological part, the meditation part, the nutritional part, they were fully empowered and um, they ran maybe one day the start area or we did a clinic on turns and that not only empowered them, gave the swimmers a sense of more specialization and allowed us to group, uh, to work with bigger groups of more diverse swimmers. So that being said, what have we done in, um, in Taniapura? I want to show a little video. This is a, a documentary that we had done for the Olympics in Rio. And I think it shows a little bit what we've done so far. Nobody cares about how much you know until they know how much you care. Different countries, but uh, one family. You have to work your butt off. He may be disqualified. What? Why? We'll see what type of character he's made of. It was a mistake. You need to be told from me. It just makes you so hungry and anxious to get there. Don't give up. Try to do your best. Inspiring countries, inspiring a subcontinent. It's amazing to be that close. A year ago, I was a completely different swimmer. I never thought that I would get this far. A small country can make it. The last chance. Finish! Whoa, how in the world do you do that? I've lost so many races. Now it's time to get some good times. Right, and obviously um, that's just a little idea of the diversity of the group of people we have, as well as the level of these swimmers, because some of them, when they came to the program, we were to develop the program in a country that literally didn't have anybody that knew how to swim properly, or we had a couple of swimmers from India or Sri Lanka, and one of them did 153 in the 200 butterfly two weeks ago, which is already at a fairly high level. So the first thing I want to begin with is to talk about empathy, okay? Because we understand that empathy is something that somebody is born with or that comes with our culture or comes with our um, um, family. But empathy literally is something that we learn. And, and I want to start with a very abstract example, okay? If you put two kids up on the stage with two different boxes, all right? And you have adults and kids watching the scene. Kid number one puts a ball in the box with the star and leaves. Then kid number two takes the ball for a reason we don't know, takes the ball from that box, puts it in the box with a heart and leaves. If you ask the adults, where will kid number one come and search for the ball? They will all say, in the one with the star, that's where he left it, he doesn't know it was changed. But if you ask kids that are younger than eight, they'll say, no, he'll look in the one with the heart. Why? Because that's where I last saw it. But it doesn't matter where you saw it. The kid left and he didn't know I saw it, put it, they don't have empathy. They cannot relate to the change because they're too young and they haven't been trained. A similar case occurs, um, or I saw with my own swimmers, um, they live and eat at, on site in Taniapura. So they eat at a buffet, and in that buffet, right in front of the exit door, 
we have three water dispensers. So one is next to the door, and the other one furthest away from the door is closest to their table. When kids come for the first time, they serve water on the first water dispenser. I don't know if you can imagine the problem already, but if I serve water on the first water dispenser, I'm blocking the other two and the exit door. But they don't do it to block anybody. They do it because they don't have the concept of empathy learned yet. Then they see a big line of people waiting, and the fourth time they realize, if I go to the furthest um, water dispenser, then I can leave the other two open and free more space for my friends. And that is very abstract, but then we have um, some, I hope as we go through the um, clinic or the conference, we have some more practical um, uses of, of that. So this is a swimmer that trained in a lake. He comes to train with us, and I'm trying to coach him like I coach everyone else, telling him the normal vocabulary that we use as coaches. So when he's swimming butterfly, I want him to hold his breath. The last thing I think about is telling him, Bebeto, please keep your head in the water. I want him to hold his breath, so I say, hold your breath. I think you can hit the video. So he's holding his breath. The video is the one on the left. He's holding his breath, and his breath will be held when he has the head in the water, as well as when he breathes every, when he gets the head out of the water, he's still holding his breath, which doesn't make any sense for a coach. We want to make him streamline. But to him, video? OK, breath holding, please go. So I don't know if you have enough quality to see it there, but every time he gets a head out of the water, he still has the mouth closed. And when I tell him, but hold your breath, he says, I am. So um, to develop empathy with him, we need to understand what he understands, all right? As well, um, what I feel, and I've, I've heard some of the other speakers, and I think it's fantastic that most of them are so humble, and, and I, I feel that's a very important trait. And being humble in coaching, it's not about saying, no, I'm not a good coach. It's about giving credit to your swimmers. In this case, I think some of the things that have really helped me has been uh, accepting when I have made a mistake and sharing the burden with my swimmers. So one of uh, the first swimmers that I had at an international level in Thailand, um, we went to an open water swim. And he was always very nervous before competing, and he was a subpar competitor. He had 15, uh, 1630 in a 1500, and quite a short guy. And so at the 10K, um, I say, hey, why don't we try something new? Let's drink coffee and see if the caffeine gives you an extra push. And he got really sick in the middle of the race. He had to quit because the caffeine gave him stomach problems. So the next day I wrote on Facebook, literally, I'm so sorry, I won't make that mistake with you again. It's all my fault. And to him, that was taking a load off his back. Two weeks later, he drove 45 seconds, went 1548 in the 1500, and qualified for the Sea Games, and then he was a silver medalist at the Southeast Asian Games in long open water. And I think it was critical that at the point where he was having a hard time, I took the blame that was my part. And I could give many examples, but I'm, I'm using another two. Shivani is our Indian Olympian, and uh, the, the year she went to the Olympics, she had a really tough time 
for a couple of months, not only did she not, not improve, but she was getting worse and worse. And the unconditional support that we showed made them not only go through that, but she insists on coming back to us every year. And the same happens with Sachin. Sachin is the butterflyer, national record holder in India. And like I said, he won 153 two weeks ago. But the Olympic year, he had an injury and we couldn't detect it. And we thought he was overstressed. So, you know, the doctor said surprise spinatus, then they said infraspinatus, then they said, um, they said different things. And when we found it, I made it a very important point that it was my mistake because I hadn't believed them and I didn't take it seriously enough. And, and to him, at that point, he was angry because he had been for three months trying to find out what he had. And once the coach said, you know, it's my fault. Thank God we found it. Um, that totally changed the game for him. You know, he went on to um, be the first Indian, I believe, to do the A-cut at the World Championships here. And um, I think that moment was a threshold moment. All right, and now I want to talk just for a minute <clears throat> about um, how leadership is cultural. This is a little experiment we did in Tanyapura with our employees, all right? And the red dots is where they feel they are in terms of how much they influence, <laughs> how much they influence their people, their leadership, as compared to how much um, they have a degree that allows them to lead. So up there would be the king, and up there would be um, Mahatma Gandhi, very influential person. So what we found is that in general, the Asian people we have, uh, from Thailand and from um, Nepal and from um, Philippines. Where they thought they were to where they thought they wanted to be, they needed more accreditation to get it. They cannot, and, and vice versa. If somebody gives them a command, they need to feel that they have more accreditation. But the Westerners, we feel we can be more leaders without the need of having, except one of them, he wants to be the CEO. But all the, all the others feel they don't need the accreditation to be more leaders. So we say, you know, if, if you don't have leadership skills, you're a victim, always complaining and, and you have problems. And if you have a status of leader and you don't exert it, then you're a powerful victim but you're still a victim. You're not doing anything for everybody's situation. But if you have leadership, you're an inspiration. And anybody in the team can be an inspiration. Any of your swimmers, any of your coaches, anybody can be taught to be inspiring. And creating that culture of being inspiring doesn't require to be great. It doesn't require to have a degree, but you need to create that culture. I, I think as coaches, part of the idea to work with a diverse group is that we create that culture that anybody can inspire, that anybody can be a leader, that you don't need to be um, accredited for that. All right? So uh, if we're going to leave as coaches, I just want to go through this really quick because <sighs> The truth is, if we're going to leave, and I'm just quoting, um, if you want to be liked all the time, then, then don't be a leader. Be an assistant coach and be the nice guy. But if you want to be a leader, be ready to be challenged, to be misunderstood, to um, not be liked. And when you're questioned, um, you need to Stand by your ideas. That doesn't mean you cannot change your mind. 
You can go home and change your mind, but obviously if you're gonna leave, you need to be convinced of what you're doing. And you're gonna be um, challenged all the time. So um, I wanna talk about different coaches or different leaders, but I, I have already stated to me the great coaches are humble. And how are they humble? They are not humble by saying, oh, I'm not a good coach, I don't know anything. No, they don't say that. They give the credit to the other people. They say, yeah. So I'm sitting at the SEA Games and I see Eddie Reese, who is one of the great coaches in the world, and he happens to be the brother of one of my first um, bosses. And I'm, you know, I go to him and I say, hey, I worked with Randy 20 years ago, blah, blah, blah. And he's talking to me. I say, God, you've been here forever. How long are you going to stay here? He says, well, I will stop coaching when one of these three things stop happening. Number one, if I stop getting better at coaching. Right now, when I coach, my swimmers get better and I do it with less effort. I'm learning. When I stop doing that, maybe I'll quit. Number two, when I keep, I stop having fun. Right now, this is fun for me. Number three, when my swimmers stop laughing at my jokes. And, and I found that extremely reflective of how Eddie Reese is and how the people that have coached for a long time successfully are. You know, we get a lot of national teams coming to Taniapura and, and I see um, Caroli Toros and I see um, um, the Australian coaches and Peter Bishop and they all are having fun with their swimmers and they're all engaged with them. Um, and the other comment he made is this swimmer is so talented. I have a swimmer that's so talented. He's going to make me look like I know something. He's going to make me look like a good coach. So he's always making these comments that make other people share the merit, the glory, you know. So in, in, in a way, I don't say jokes. My swimmers don't laugh at me. So I try to do fun things instead. I'm not funny. I try to do something that's fun or try to engage them into doing something that's fun. And, and by that, I mean, I mean, I try to get um, a sense of family where they share. And having fun, okay, this, I, I just took a picture of this book because I think it's very important. But I didn't want to sound like I made it up, okay? Having fun. American medical, the American Medical Association has stated that stress causes 80 to 85% of all, in this case, injuries. And how do we avoid injury? Uh, Peter um, Andrew was talking yesterday about the mind. Every physical event is preceded by a psychological event, okay? And the basketball coach at the University of Georgia is explaining we never get injured. How do we get, never get injured? Because I tell my team we're not gonna get injured. And I tell my team, you guys, you're gonna stretch until you're ready, and then more. And when I come to the pool, I expect you to be doing different um, dynamic mobility exercises that we learn from different experts so that you never get injured. And that mindset, the mindset that we will do the things we need to prevent injury, we will warm up before practice and do some exercises to keep us strong, but we will not get injured, the swimmers buy into it. The, the, it happens. It happens if you as a coach insist that we need to do the things that are gonna stop us from getting injured. Okay, and the other part is every time we can, we increase the number of people that work with us. Not one coach for a team, but one support group. And the support group tries to bring experts, even if it's once. Um, 
if, if your opinions are validated by somebody that comes from outside and says the same thing in a different way, if um, you have your parents in line with you, and instead of the parents giving their swimmers a different correction, you educate them and make them part of your support group, and you tell them, these are the corrections I'm giving, you support that. Don't tell him to do another correction. I'm trying to correct the high elbow, and you're going out there saying, kick, and he kicks like hell already. But if you get him to be part of your support group, and you bring a nutritionist instead of you telling them what to eat, um, they will get more credibility. And the opposite is true. Being a professional is about not trying to do what we are not trained to do. So if you're not an expert on something, if you're not training to, trained to handle a situation, you send them to an expert, don't play doctor. If we're not doctors and somebody's injured, send them to an expert if you can, all right? And listen to the expert. And, and I just put a couple of pictures with our mind trainer and our psychologist and the kids trying to have a little fun, but as well, trying to get exposed to different people. Um, our mind trainer, worked with the Dalai Lama for a while, and, and our psychologist um, is based in Singapore and came, comes very seldom, but when she comes, we get um, the chance to work. And then we got the Dutch national team to come there for a month, and, and I just th thought, I'm gonna get an expert, so. Hey, I'm Jan Herber, I'm a physiotherapist of the Dutch national team, and I'm here to give some uh, extra exercises to the FINA kids here in Tanyapura today. I'm on Twitter as well as at Physio Herbert. You can find me there. So in the end, every time I get one of the coaches go to Tanyapura, if I have a chance, I get them to work with my team. And that doesn't make me less of a coach. I believe by bringing some expert from a different field, it reinforces my point. Okay, now when we talk about working with a very um, heterogeneous group, which um, I guess I prefer the word um, a more um, diverse group, the first thing is you need to make them accountable. So they need to have the habit of thinking about the stroke corrections we're doing. And we'll talk about stroke corrections in five minutes. But some of the problems with stroke corrections in a diverse group as we have it in FINA, and you all may not have the same problems, uh, we get a swimmer that comes at age 20 and swam for 10 years with a bad habit. Um, we have our friends from uh, Maldives and they swim in a pool in the middle of the ocean. So you have no walls and no floor, and you're swimming and you have never been filmed. When you want to correct those people, you need to make it a habit for them to repeat the same small detail every day. Otherwise, at age 20 and after 10 years of swimming in the ocean, it's very hard to make a correction last, okay? Now, if we think about how to motivate these people and we talk about the cultural difference, and I'm trying to go a little bit in sociology here, but if we talk about the basis of how people meditated, okay? The basis of meditation are humans crave. We crave to get away from pain, or we crave to repeat pleasure. And that's basis number one. All swimmers, will try to get away with painful situations, and they will try to repeat pleasurable situations. And number two, through history, humans have known resources are limited. That we have the, a certain amount of resources for all humans. So if you want more, you need to take it away from somebody else. And that has driven humanity for a long time. And therefore, if you want a lot more, you're greedy. And greed is something to be discouraged. Now, thank God we have changed the whole 
we've shifted the whole mentality. Number one, because new resources, resources are not limited. They can be invented or found by technology, by brain ingenuity. We can create new energy sources, new materials. In fact, if you went to a big um, dinner with Napoleon and you were a very important guest, they would give you aluminum cutlery because it was so difficult to get. And the poor people, the, you know, the middle class, they gave them gold. You know, if Napoleon woke up now and he saw the aluminum wraps uh, surrounding our leftover food, he would be puzzled. He wouldn't understand what's happened. But back then, we didn't have the technology to create available aluminum. And the same happens um, in craving. What happens in craving is if we think resources are unlimited, it also creates a sense, the sense of purpose. And the sense of purpose teaches our swimmers to postpone gratification, which is very difficult in the 21st century because people want instant gratification. But by teaching them to belong to something, we belong to this FINA group. We're not a team, we're a family. And, and we're all helping each other from different countries, but we're all trying to raise not only the level of swimming, but the awareness of what this means for everybody. Then they're willing to train harder, and they are avoiding that craving for another one, the sense of belonging. Sense of belonging is very strong, and it's cultural as well, because it depends on understanding that greed is not a bad thing, that by trying to create more things, we open the doors to more resources, that as coaches, by sharing all our ideas, new ideas will pop up. And the more you give to the community, the more you teach them, the more things you learn and more, the more the community will teach you. In that sense, because the coaching community is a fantastic sharing community, and I feel that every time people come to Taniapura and we share a dinner or whatever, we're talking about swimming all the time. Swimming has grown tenfold compared to the 1980s when we, they were all hiding what they did to the other people, you know, and everything was secrecy. And sharing the knowledge definitely leads to new knowledge. And if the, I say Eastern society, because it's, I work in Thailand with many of these southeastern countries, <clears throat> teaching them ambition will help them deal with suffering and disappointment much better. All right? And, and linked to that idea is the idea that every time I go to a clinic, I learn more at the coffee or when we ask questions than I learn um, when I'm sitting there and, and taking notes. So one example, we, I went to do a clinic in, in India and, and, and the questions, uh, this coach asked me about ankle flexibility and after I gave him my answer, I said, how would you do it? And we opened the most amazing um, debate on fascial stretching of the shins with the tennis ball and how there's different ways not only to stretch it but to um, relieve the, the fascia and, and that's just one example because it happens to me all the time. Um, uh, when I got uh, Mia Nielsen training with us for a couple of months and, and we were doing the workouts and she would come and say, no, Miguel, um, how about we do this and we do that? And she gave me new ideas. Um, when we went to Botswana, Botswana doesn't have a high level of swimming, but they had the highest level of participation. And they were asking questions and they were sharing ideas. And that debate, when you go outside and you get the coffee, that's where we sometimes learn the most. And I think it's important that we point it out. And, and finally, in the part of, um, of philosophy, I guess, there is something I have in my whiteboard all the time. And I try to explain this to my swimmers because I think it's very important that my swimmers um, get these concepts. And the number one is an adaptation of something Wayne Goldsmith said that if you chart talent versus perseverance, 
Only 5% of the Olympians are high talent and low perseverance. Only 5%, and I may be exaggerating to the high. However, 80% of the coaches' frustrations come from there. We all, as coaches, get angry with that super talented swimmer that could be secret, and we don't get to convince him. People that don't have talent or perseverance, they're great to maintain the financial viability of the, of the program. They pay, you put them in a corner, and 20% of the Olympians are Michael Phelps. 20% of the Olympians are high talent and high perseverance. However, and this, again, is what I tell my swimmers, and it's, it's adapted from Wayne Goldsmith, 75% of the Olympians are very high perseverance and middle talent, middle high talent but they're not the most talented. The most talented form in total 25%. It's the people that over a long period of time keep training hard. And why do I have this in my whiteboard? Because I want my swimmers to believe this. Okay, and in my whiteboard I have this other quote that says, in swimming, minimizing resistance is always more important than increasing propulsive force. And I have it written like this. I don't have it, that's why I took a picture and I put it. I don't, I don't want it to be written with nice words. I want to write it on my whiteboard every time it deletes. So detecting talent is less important than creating the, the conditions for that talent to be able to really grow. Talent identification would matter if we have little resources. But if people without talent pay the bills, then that's what they do. People without talent are the ones that get resources for the people with talent. What's important is that we don't focus our efforts on the little kids that develop early and discourage the late bloomers that, or the people that don't really have that much talent and they're here and they get discouraged and they never get to there, which are 75% of the Olympians. And what's important to me, right now I have a kid with amazing talent and so-so, uh, to say the most, so-so perseverance. So every time I see him fooling around, I calm down and I say, I'm not going to be that 80% of frustration. I'm going, to focus, I'm going to focus on the other kids, and if he makes it, so be it. But if he doesn't, I want to focus on the 75%. All right, let's talk a little bit about technique work. All right, and I want to relate technique work to um, young kids. So people ask me, you know, you have it, an 11-year-old, and he's training with the older people, and obviously he doesn't do the 10 sessions, but... I put them with the young people, and they say, because this talk is about heterogeneous swimmer. We have a big group, and I don't have a lot of coaches. So sometimes we have to mix them up. So what's the limit? The limit with the younger swimmers, in my eyes, is technical proficiency. Okay? If a swimmer is swim with, swimming with sloppy technique, they reduce the distance. The young swimmer, it's not keeping a six-speed kick or doing catch-up or doing bad technique, then they're not allowed to continue at that intensity of training. When we do technical corrections, and like I said, I get people that have uh, trained for 10 years on their own and then they come to my program. I, I'm never scared of over-exaggerating. They think they're doing a radical change and they're actually doing very small change. So, there is a breaststroker and I film her underwater and I say, I don't, I don't want that angle there. Bring your hip to the front, create a straight line. So she goes again, it's worse. Miguel, I swear to God, that I exaggerated so much. No, you're not. Film it again, hasn't changed one bit. And 
we work on these things for an hour with per swimmer. I get one swimmer, I take them one hour, we correct that thing for one hour. And in that hour, at the very end, they may be doing it, they think they're doing it super exaggerated, whether it is um, putting the water in backstroke at one o'clock, or whether it is bringing the hip to the front, or the high elbow, you name it. Um, all these things, um, they think they're overdoing when the testing proves otherwise. So we empower the swimmers. Um, we let them film and correct each other. We film them every day. And we film them with a GoPro. And this is actually a broomstick because I'm too cheap to buy the, the official thing. And we watch it right away with an iPad. So it's instant and it's super cheap. But when I hear people say, no, it's too much money, it's too much problem, GoPro, iPad, one minute. <clears throat> and, and I think it's important because we need to be practical and analysis needs to be instant. Um, I, Penny Haynes was uh, very um, super nice and she came to Tanya Pura and gave us a speech. And she explained how they would film her, then pack the film, send it to another country, evaluate it, send it back, and three weeks later she got the feedback. It's more important that we film every day and watch every day instantly, and then we start learning on the little details. So when we film, first, we let the swimmers correct each other in specific areas that we work that day, okay? Second, we do not make more than one change per day, because that messes up their stroke. And, and that's something I have found, that some of my swimmers go and get analyzed by another coach, and they come with a list of 10 things. And their stroke is all messed up. And all 10 things are correct. And I say, wait, give me the list, put it in my pocket, here. Week number one, you're gonna focus on this one concept. And after that week, when he gets it perfect, they say, okay, now we're going to work on concept number two. And they're all correct, but if they try to implement them all together, they mess up their stroke. It's not enough. All right, so um, according to the French experts, talent is the ability to learn a new task at an excellent rate. So a talented swimmer is a swimmer that corrects his mistakes faster than other people. All right? And we may be doing different drills. And um, can you hit video number one? And take the sound off. So this is uh, Golf Sapien Chai, and now she's in Texas A&M. But um, she trains with us in the summer, and she trained with us for many years. And she's swimming with the paddle. The paddle on the head, pushing it to the front. And all we're trying to teach them is to keep very frontal velocity. Okay, and the other swimmer, um, that's Annie Jane, who just broke the national records for India in breaststroke, which is not much, because India doesn't have many good breaststrokers. Uh, can you hit the one in the bottom? But she's the one that I was trying to correct that bent knee, and it's really hard. And what we're trying to do here is try to teach longer, them. Longer, 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 and shorter. To be longer okay. with the scapula and engage their core a little better, and then strike to the front. Go. Very good. Strike to the front. Beautiful, thanks. Now, is the drill gonna make the swimmer better? No. The fact that she can correct her mistakes faster than other people would. And, and that's the difficult part because um, they come with these habits, and no matter how much you tell them, they think, I'm not bending my knee, and, and I'm striking to the front. I'm not going down and up. What are you talking about? I'm striking to the front. And then you film them, and you see the hands going down and up and down and up. Um, so if talent is the ability to change one's mistake at a fast rate, developing talent is as simple as continuing to insist in a small detail that other coaches may have missed. So this swimmer, when she finishes the kick, she does this. 
She's kicking with a little toe, toe extension at the end. And the fact that we pick on it may be more important that we say even higher elbow. The, the elbow is okay. It's the extension of the toes at the ends. And right here, she's creating so much resistance to the water, the kick is actually pushing her backwards. And by pointing her toes at the end of that kick, she'll get, remember the two slides before? Less resistance, more important than increasing propulsive force. So you increase propulsive force, kick harder. You know, the father is, kick harder. She has a fantastic father, so there's not the case, but, you know, kick harder. What do you mean kick harder? She's kicking all the way to the bottom of the pool and she is slowing herself down. Minimize resistance, but to do this, you film the group a couple of times per week and we insist in that detail for quite a few days. I spend one hour per swimmer going, stopping, looking, opening, closing. Let's look at the back. Does the back have a hollow here? Can she put her belly in and put the head? Okay, how is the elbow? How is the coordination between one hand and the other? Are the shoulders connected? Are the hips connected? Now let's look at the feet. How is it here? How is it a little bit further ahead? She had good flexibility at the beginning of the kick, but not at the end. She's extending her toes. Okay? And in my opinion, we add a lot of variety. We do a lot of trails. That's the, the one thing on the fantastic presentation that I saw yesterday from, from US RTP. The one thing that I don't totally agree with is that I believe drills transfer to the full swim if you know why. So always know why you're doing the drill. We do different drills, but always with a purpose. Okay, what you do is not as important as why you do it. I believe very much that swimmers need to do a lot of front linear velocity. That means you want, you want to move all, you want to do all your energy to the front and pull the water to the back. And how do we try to explain that to kids that are on the marble universe, you know? So you guys are pushing water to your body. How does Iron Man fly in the Avengers? You know, the, stream, the jet stream directly back. What will happen if his jets go to his body? He'll get burned. He'll get pushed everywhere. So try, try to understand that we want to be linear in the front and in the back. So with the butterfly recovery, we try to be flatter. Can we get the video? And this is the Syrian kid who just went under two minutes in the 200 butterfly, went down to 157. I can and see a lot of splash. Try not to make splash. Don't let the heels come back. We're okay, trying to teach him to throw to the front. And then the high elbows. Okay, can we get the second video with Annie? And that's the breaststroker. Again, we're trying to teach her to strike to the front, not let the hands go and up and down. to the front. And put the head down. So they streamline properly without the, letting the hands go up and down. But it's not about the drill because we do hundreds of drills. It's about them understanding why we do it. All right? Um, same happens with the workouts, okay? You wanna adapt the workouts to a big group. And the first idea is you need to adapt the workout to the best swimmers in the group. So, Again, I'm having this conversation with uh, Dean Boxall from Australia, and he says, oh, I was talking to um, Grant Hackett's coach, and he is um, having this discussion with Rick Needling. Now, this story is secondhand already. And he said, Rick Needling could do 2100s on 110 and hold 60s. But he, couldn't, he could not hold 57s on 140. And then, um, Rand Hackett's coach said, but Rand cannot do 2100s on 110 and, and do 60, but he can do 
4,100 to 140 and hold 57, and that's the problem. He's not going fast enough to train competition speed. Now that, to me, gives me ideas on how I need to work with a big group, because um, if, if you want to work with a big group, they need to be competition specific, speed specific. When we're talking about race work and you have a big group and you can't individualize, maybe they don't need to do 2100s, maybe they can do 2075s. So we create options in a diverse group, number one. Well, the 80% rule means you push your training to the limit but 80% of the sets need to be performed with technical perfection. And I may allow a little percentage of survival technique or sloppy effort, but in a set that's designed for the elite swimmers, let's say for 100 and 230, for 100s doing the last 25 fast and 130. The younger swimmers may do for 150s and 475s, but they need to maintain perfect proficient technique. So we adapt by reducing the distance by keeping everybody in the same interval. And that way we keep control over a bigger group of people. And of course, make it significant for their event. And what, what's that mean? A distance swimmer, the four 100s, instead of doing the last 25 fast, they may do the last 50 fast. And a pure sprinter may do the last 15 fast. Now, I believe, I believe, that in order to improve the aerobic capacity, um, you need to work the um, endurance levels of both fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers. And to do that, you do the aerobic capacity sets, mixing it up with a little bit of um, sprint work. And that, that's the work of John Albrecht, right? And if you have read John Albrecht, then you'll understand that aerobic capacity is not at a single speed. And, and I believe in that. But I also believe that if, if you are a sprinter, you need to go higher speed with shorter distance within the aerobic set, within that aerobic capacity set. And um, when we adapt the workouts and we have a big group, and remember, we are a hotel. So we get a lot of new clients every week. I don't complicate the evaluation. I give them every week a set where they evaluate their balance. And I'll give an example, and this is exactly that, an example. If a new swimmer comes and I say, okay, we're gonna do eight 200s are your best time plus 30 with 20 seconds rest. You've got 150, you're gonna go on 220, and you're gonna go on 240. And your stroke rate needs to be 28 and your heart rate needs to be from 150 to 160. And that means your aerobic capacity is in balance approximately with your time. And then another day we have three times 450s so on 115 at 200 speed, which if you go 150 is 27.5 from a push. And you go 450s, 27.5, you rest a minute, you do it three times. You manage both, you're in balance. Let's try to improve both um, simultaneously. But if you're much better at the aerobic capacity, that was easy. You could do that at 25 stroke rate, and you could do that with 120 beat per minute, and you felt easy. And then you go the 450s, and you cannot hold your 200 speed, then your aerobic capacity is not in balance with the anaerobic capacity. Then we will try to promote one within understanding, like I said, that I get clients for a month because we are a hotel. The people that stay with us all year, they're different. We have other testing systems. But when a person comes and gets integrated in the group, we try to create variety by trying to explain to them this. Now, if you want to see how we would turn the workout and explain everything, let's put video number two. Or, sorry, this one? You guys, this one up because the heart will get, the chest will get pretty hard. And I want to, not only 
little bit individualized. So, Andrew, Sajan, um, Ayman, and Cheddar were going 4 100s on 115, and that's cruising speed. And then 450s on 35, and Andrew, you need to hit 30, and Sajan under 32, and that will be butterfly. Cheddar, you do three, three, one fly, three, three, 32s, and then one fly, you need to go 200 speed. All right? And the Beto, you'll do 475s and then the 450s with them, all of them. Last 50, you butterfly fast on 35, so you need to push that. Okay, and Timali, doing 475s on 115. Then the 450s, I want you to push right behind the Beto and, and make them on 35, which may be a little hard, but we need to fight just to make this. That will be the challenge, all right? Uh, you're going the 475, so I'm being a little generous. But the 450 is on 35. You need to do them backstroke and fight to make them. All right? And then you guys will do 475 on 115 and 350 on 50. But you need to go on the 36. Okay. Okay? Now, so I don't know if you get an idea, but what we're doing, what I'm doing here with a diverse group. They have four 100s on 115 and then 450s butterfly on 35. And the younger kids will do 475s on 115 and 350s on 50. So we all finish each round together. They're all going fairly manageable because I can control the whole group while being focused on the people that are going 450s butterfly on 35. Those are the most important people of the group, but the others get a significant workout. And they don't get abandoned. They don't do um, a totally different interval, and I don't know where they are five minutes from now. They may lose five seconds and get a five second extra rest, but we're trying to make diversity, in this case, in um, the variety of um, the way we set up the set. Okay, and I, I just wanted to finish the, um, the presentation with the question, okay? And the question, to me, is very important to diverse swimming. Does hard work beat talent? And in my chart, my argument is 75% of the time, okay, being the other 25, not beating it. But whether I'm right or wrong, I think it's the best message we can send our swimmers. Does hard work beat talent? Now, in this presentation, I haven't gone in depth in basically anything. I've tried to raise more questions than answers so that when you guys, um, because some of you have coached much better swimmers than me, some of you have succeeded at a much higher level, I want to broaden that level. How can we reach more people with what we know? And what's a more inspiring concept than hard work beats talent, right? So even the most talented swimmer in the world will fail. Even Michael Phelps will fail if they are lazy, if they don't have hardworking partners working around them or, or train alone with your father. But in general, the culture of the group we create does a lot more for um, the individual swimmer than relying on the talent he may or may not have. And I believe in that. And um, I hope to convince you guys to believe in that as well. Any questions or does anybody have an opinion on that that they want to open a conversation about? Thank you very much, Miguel. Let's give a round of applause for Miguel. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>